Thanks everyone for coming. This is the third of our four fall puppet forums at the Ballard Institute Museum of Puppetry. Uh, my name is John Bell. I'm the director of the Ballard Institute. Uh, my colleague Emily Wicks is, is, is working. She's the director of uh, manager of operations and everything else. Uh, our grad assistant is Felicia Cooper and our undergraduate fellow is uh, Tracy Becker, and uh, I wanted to let you know that uh, we'll be going till about 8.30 tonight, so it can coincide with the closing of the bookstore. We've got uh, two exhibitions here that you might have walked through, and might, might want to walk back through. Our next part of our performance series is a performance on, I don't know when, I'm look looking for my friend Emily. Oh, wait, wait. wait. It's number seven. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. See what I knew. Um, is uh, December 7th, Peter and the Wolf by National Marionette Theatre. And then uh, the next forum part of this series will be Annie Rollins, who curated uh, Chasing Ghosts. Or, well, her the presentation will be called Chasing Ghosts. It's based on her exhibition, Immaterial Remains. That'll be Thursday, December 5th. And, and, and that's about it. We hope you, you can sign up on a sign-up sheet in the front if you want. We are doing this, as I said earlier, co-sponsored by the School of Engineering. The School of Fine Arts and the School of Engineering are entering upon a really interesting collaboration that is going to produce all sorts of interesting work, and we're very happy um, that uh, Professor Dr. Mehdi Anwar is here with Robert Griffo and Christopher Hoskins to talk about the uh, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parades, and Tony Sark, and the invention of inflatable puppets, which is this great feat of engineering. Um, Robert Grippo is, has been a frequent participant in Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parades. He's been researching the history of the parade for many years. He grew up on Long Island, spent 20 years in the credit card industries, and uh, also enjoyed a lifelong avocation as a Macy's historian, of which there are not many, or any others, maybe. Now retired, Robert is a full-time writer whose works include Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, the book back there, which is for sale, and which you can get <laughs> autographed by the authors after, after this event. Christopher Hoskins is a professional photographer who grew up in Long Island, now lives in upstate New York. Uh, work, was a, worked at Macy's. Uh, performed with inflatables in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day parades and uh, collaborated with Robert in, in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day parade book. I don't know what else I should say, but that's happy to be here. Dr. Mehdi Anwar currently serves as a full professor in UConn's electrical and computer engineering department. He's the director of the uh, in National Science Foundation funded Industry University Cooperative Research Center. He's been the Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Education at the School of Engineering uh, in the, till 2009. Founding Director of the Department of Homeland Security Center of Excellence until 2009. And Interim Director of the Kinetic Global Fuel Cell Center through 2009. And then this is very interesting. There's, Dr. Anwar's interests include localization of one-dimensional structures, transport and semiconductor <laughs> devices, impurity diagnostics and quantum well structures, SB-based type two infrared detectors, noise and semiconductor devices, power performance of GAN-based HFETS and circuits, which I probably mispronounced, but okay, very good. So, um, That's we, amazing. so yeah, indeed. We, uh, we invite you to sign this sign-up sheet so we can let people know that folks actually came to this. And uh, we are really happy, and I, I thought I'd turn it over to Dr. Anwar. Uh, I don't think you're here to listen to me. Yes, you have a question? Can you dim the lights? It's really hard to see from back here. Is that possible? So I've never talked in my life that I'll be sitting over here 
addressing an audience like this. Uh, uh, I thought uh, that the best time I had was actually I taught IP law at George Mason School of Law. And I thought that was something great. But I think this is even better. All right. Uh, with that being said, so I have a small thing that I wrote down, and I don't think it's going to take more than five minutes. Uh, so makes this Thanksgiving a parade, which is synonymous with the holidays, celebrates Thanksgiving leading to Christmas. You all know that. The event started in 1934, and Robert is going to talk about it, and continues with a brief uh, disruption during the Second World War. It is not that this is the only Thanksgiving the parade. There are some that predates Macy's, but this is the one that's most well known. The parade is an expensive undertaking, costing in the neighborhood, the neighborhood of about $12 million. Of that, about $9 million is allocated for costumes and supplies. Each giant balloon in the parade uses on the average, each giant balloon in the parade uses on the average about 5,000 cubic feet of helium. And filling all the balloons costs about half a million dollars. Sponsoring a brand new balloon will cost you $190,000. And for $90,000 for each consecutive year. Construction of the floats ranges from 30,000 to about 100,000. To summarize, helium, parade, floats, supplies, taxes, and logistics is roughly around 1.5 to about 3.4 million. The balloons are huge. The Ronald McDonald balloon is about 6 to 7 feet tall, 6 to 1 feet long, and 20 feet wide. So depending upon the size of the balloon, which is roped to a car, to keep it under control, it takes about 40 to 90 people to guide it down the streets of New York City. But in order to verify it, you have to talk to Chris, because he was the balloon handler in Chris's delivery. So each handler has to weigh 120 pounds and must be in good health. New York City requires the speed, wind speeds below 23 miles per hour with gusts to 34 for the balloons to fly. So now, the balloon shells are made of fabric coated with polyurethane, which is a kind of plastic, and it takes color well and it is flexible. So this is a departure from the original design when the figures were made of rubber. One of the reasons the periods were canceled in the Second World War had to do with melting the balloons and extract rubber for Goodyear to supply U.S. Army with the blimps. So you have to remember that the Akron-based Goodyear was already in the blimp business before they got involved in producing the inflatable characters for Macy's Deprobate. So now, a little bit of science. On the average, each balloon contains about 120,000 cubic feet of helium and could lift about 750 pounds. It takes about 90 minutes to inflate each balloon. So before heading to Manhattan, the balloons are designed in an old Tootsie Road factory in Hoboken, New Jersey. Hmm. Uh, so, and take it to New York City for inflation the day before. So now if you're free, Thursday of next week, and you would like to watch the inflation process, Take the BRC trains to 72nd Street. <laughs> Go to the 74th Street and Columbus Avenue, <coughs> the public entrance to Manhattan Museum of Natural History, in between 1 p.m. and 8. So here are facts. It is a it is a fine is a finite resource and it results a billion years of radioactive decay. It cannot be produced chemically. Most of the helium on Earth originates in natural gas deposit with the largest deposit in the States, Algeria and Qatar, the Middle East. Tanzania's East Africa Rift Valley could have a reserve of about 9 billion cubic feet. US helium resources and reserves hold about 744 billion cubic feet, and the rest of the world accounts for about an additional trillion cubic feet. Use of helium is not only as a lifting gas, uh, but has other very important applications in advanced electronics and cryogenics. And I think Professor Doug Hamilton, who's sitting at the back, will actually vouch for it. He's a professor of physics. So for the technologists in you, helium is the second element on the periodic table, atomic number two. An atomic radius about 0.49 angstrom, which is very small. 
uh, is the lightest inert gas with a boiling tap point of 4.2 degrees Kelvin or minus 268.93 degrees centigrade. And it is fun using helium. <laughs> uh, because I think I watched one of the Kazakhstan speakers who was a Nobel laureate. And the best part thing is actually you take a banana and you dip it in liquid helium, you take it out and you crush it, and it's all in small pieces, and you can eat it with just with your uh, uh, popcorn or whatever cereal. <laughs> so one cubic feet of helium at sea level can lift 0 0.064 pounds. No, helium weighs 0 0.011. Four pounds per cubic feet, and it displaces 0 0.0807 pounds of air. The rest is Archimedes' principle. On the average, each balloon contains, as I've said, 120 cubic feet of helium. And so, and but the thing is, the balloons are never filled. At the, as the day heats up it causes the gas to expand, and it plumps up the balloon. So you'll find out, and this is what we call Charles' Law. So it is Boyle's Law, Charles' Law, that's in chemistry, or also in physics. So the balloon operators, you know better, always will move the balloon to the sunny side, because we like to warm it up as the day goes on. So I'm an electrical engineer by profession, as you've heard. We innovate, and one simple way to generate and and one simple way to generate new ideas is to look at other seemingly uncorrelated disciplines. That's why I'm here today. So most of the interesting sciences and engineering seems to lie at this particular interface of seemingly dissimilar interfaces or disciplines. We do not discover engineers; we create. So a sentiment that was best articulated by Theodore von Kerman, scientists discover the world that exists. Engineers create the world that never was. So electrical engineering, we facilitate communication, the cell phone. Puppetry is communication. So that's the link that I see in between the two. So engineering is the art of making assumptions. We simply make assumptions, nothing, approximations making things better, making them safe, structurally stable, and most importantly, affordable. We see that the progression in the design of infl inflatable characters from artistic rendition to cat cam, going from rubber to polyurethane, going from O2 to mix of helium and air, now to helium, the use of pneumatics and hydraulics to give expressions and movements, to create a new generation of characters, creating a new electronic platform for visual puppetry. What's next? Self-learning puppets. <laughs> Utilizing the ongoing research on deep learning. Self-healing puppets. Self-guiding while they are self-guiding. Will they morph into something different? Like the Transformers? <laughs> the future is rather exciting, not only for puppetry, but for also for engineering. We adapt and we adopt. Whatever we say good, we borrow it. So enough of, enough of my monologue. We steal it. We steal it. <laughs> <laughs> so we are here today, Robert Grippo, Christopher Hoskins, and our own John Bell. Uh, uh, and Chris there is the author of the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, and he will talk about and they will talk about the history of Macy's inflatables, their evolution over years based upon business models, tradition, and technology. John Bell, director, Bellard Institute of Museum and Puppetry, and Professor of Dramatic Arts, will address the role of puppetry in this dialogue. Will follow this will follow a discussion on the inflatables within the context of puppetry and engineering, and we'll also entertain a few questions from the audience. Very Finally, I uh, would like to thank the Bellard Institute for hosting it.
and the School of Fine Arts and the School of Engineering for sponsoring this. So with that, I give the floor to Robert and Chris. Thank you so much. So nice to see some Macy's Parade fans always at this time of the year. Yeah, just call me Chris. Christopher is very formal. And this is uh, Robert Ripper. And uh, again, uh, we started this book project uh, in, by 97? 97. Um, I was, again, I, I worked at the parade as, uh, I, worked, I was in college and I was a, uh, worked through Macy's as an employee. And uh, Bob and I began life as, as movie buffs. We worked in a newsletter, and one day my friend here came up with an idea of working on a book about the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. So I thought that was a unique idea. I, I've never seen a book about that. And we, I, I had a little background. Bob was a huge fan. So that's how we started our collaboration, and we had a very interesting process. We had, we had uh, no resources. We had no, uh, there was no historian. There was no. Uh, Macy's was kind of we're kind of the outside, so we started researching uh, backwards, which means that we find the information and then we would find the photograph that would thankfully concur what we found. So that's how we worked for about three years, and uh, it is it is a very it's interesting that we're here before right here for the puppetry because mm -hmm. even though we think of Macy's, we think of the uh, we think of other celebrities and floats and marching bands, which a lot of people from across America have had first-hand experience with the parade. But the stars of the parades have always been the giant balloons. And the, the genesis of the giant balloons is puppetry. And that's, that's why it's always uh, very humbling to come here, to see the, the genesis of where the ideas came from, uh, where the, the, the love, the, 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 uh, the look of a, of a balloon comes from puppetry. Now it's evolved over the years, but as we'll, we'll talk about, uh, through a gentleman like Tony Sarr, who started the, who started was the first really intuitive, creative person at the Macy's Parade. And as Bob will start out pretty much, it, it uh, well, we we'll start at the beginning of the parade. The parade, this is the, this is the official line of the parade, right? It started with, it was an immigrant parade. In 1924, Macy's wanted, to, their employees were primarily immigrants. And they wanted to have a celebration uh, like they would have in their European countries. That's the official uh, story. Mm -hmm. But of course, as we know, it's, it's Macy's, which has always been uh, a giant commercial to bring people back to their stores. That's the genesis of it. And uh, Bobby, I want you to ask you, basically when we started, what was the, what was the key thing that you found when you first, uh, first uh, uh, journey through with the information? Macy's, uh, Macy's has no idea of the history. <laughs> That's true. And we'll tell you a story, you know, as we go along. But first, I gotta say the motive here. You forgot the part with the healing where you make your voice sound kind of funny. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we'll do with it. Also, interesting, when they used healing for the first time in 1928, if you look at the ads, the ads clearly said, the safe gas, the safe helium. Evidently, there was some kind of fear that it was an unknown commodity at that time. Macy's, in fact, I think they build themselves as the world's largest user of helium because of the balloons. So I think that's one of their lines they still use. But uh, Tony Sog, he was working at Macy's doing their windows for a few years. It was the marionettes, okay? And every Christmas they unveiled the Macy's Christmas windows. What Chris and I found out, the line that we use is that Tony Sog was Walt Disney before Disney was Disney. Now what do I mean by that? Sog created children's furniture. He did magazine covers for the New Yorker. He designed wallpaper. He designed everything. But he designed marionettes. He was a marionette or a puppeteer, okay? And he basically traveled the world doing all these different shows. So he started doing the Macy's Windows in the early 20s, 22, 23, we're not sure. But for some reason in 1924, as Chris said, Macy's always used to say it was uh, employees of the store that came up with this idea. But we destroyed a few myths along the way, and I think Macy's is ready to you know, we have to go into witness protection program. They're not happy with us. In reality, if you go to Herald Square, they, it's the world's largest store. 
It's from 6th Avenue to 7th Avenue. It's like 10 stories. In 1924, Macy's completed an expansion from 6th Avenue further towards 7th. It was a slow creep, but they kept on adding. So an executive came up with the idea to do, to do the parade. When I was in the archive, one of the last times I was there, I stumbled along the minutes of, of the corporate meetings. And there is, let's do this parade. This is a great idea. In fact, there's a cost. I think the first parade cost $5,000. Okay. And that's how it started. It started as a way to promote the expansion of Macy's. But SOG got the role of creating the parade. And again, there were no elements of balloons or anything like that in the parade. What he did, he designed the Christmas windows. And you would see, example, the book, the funny frolics, whatever, you know, the merry holidays, whatever it was, it was a Christmas theme. After the, you know, the opening of the windows, it was a big hullabaloo, the press was there, people lined for miles to see his windows. So in 1924, he invents this parade. And at the end of the parade, they unveil the windows. It was mechanical windows. Speaking about technology, in late 1938 or 37, Macy's puts new windows in Herald Square. An interesting thing is, this is, I don't know if you guys are all interested in the theatrical plays and drama, <laughs> this is what this college also does. <laughs> the Macy's windows in 1938, they were invented as mini stages. Think about it. So this kind of, you know, if you're interested in theatrical stuff, think about going into a career in the department store visual merchandising. A lot of puppeteers, in fact, do that and have done that. So it's, it's besides Sarge, it's, it's like a, a It's like an intertwined, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you go to see Macy's windows, like a, like, you know, a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks, or whatever it is, right for the parade, they will unveil the windows, and you will see the elements mm -hmm. of theatrics. Mm -hmm. So, Saw did, did the parade in 24, 25. For some reason, we don't know why. Without inflatables. Right, so. without, without mm -hmm. balloons. But the marionettes were caught. They were before the parade. They were the Christmas windows. Now, we don't know why. In 1926, as John and I discussed, Norman Del Geddes did the, the, um, the design. Now, again, anybody that likes theatrical stuff, Norman Del Geddes is a very famous person in New York City today. I mean, he did a lot of murals and restaurants. I mean, people know his, his work. Mm -hmm. He was a, a Broadway designer. He did a lot of stuff like that. His, his daughter mm -hmm. later was known probably about getting, she was in Dallas, and she was a movie star in the 40s. And he also did like uh, industrial design and product design, so he had his hand kind of like Sarg in a way, went to yes. like, engineering or, or inventing new uh, mechanical, yeah. or, and, and, the, and you the know, way things looked. Right, and you know what it was? Objects. It seemed to be a community of a certain clique of people were involved in this, okay? So in 1927, Sog is back, and just before the parade, one of the Strauss family they have a press conference with Sog, and they announce, you know, at, at, at this Thursday's Thanksgiving parade, you're going to see a, a surprise giant, giant balloon, giant characters, you know, three stories, six stories tall. That's the first time we hear of the balloons. Now we don't know what was involved in this, why he did it, but this was the first year. Now the first year, there was no helium. So the balloons were air inflated. They had poles. They were tethered to poles or strings, but they basically just pulled them down the street. In 28 was the first year that they announced helium. Now again, you got puppet fans here. You got puppeteers here. What? What is the Macy's? Um, what's a Macy's balloon? Think about it. It's an upside down puppet. Okay. Sog. Right, so upside down marionette. That's right. Sog somehow came up with the idea. Let's flip this thing upside down. The strings on the bottom, the blues on top. And the helium gave him the opportunity to do this. So I said, we don't know how this, but this is a stroke of genius. And that, that for that very first year when it wasn't, or the first couple of years when it wasn't helium, he do we think that he, as you said, he, he came up with this idea and then contacted Goodyear Rubber himself and did it all himself. I think earlier you were saying that 
it wasn't so much Macy's figuring this out, but Sarg uh, was the one who really made this happen. So I'm, I'm imagining that he had to make those connections to Goodyear and get those first puppets built, even though they weren't using helium. You see, that's, you know what? I wish we could find those archives. We don't know where any of his papers exist. You know, we found some stuff. As I explained to John earlier, uh, Saw came from Germany, and he wound up in, in Ohio somehow. I think his, his, his wife, yeah. I think his wife, through his wife, I think her family, Bart back there was shaking, said, yeah, I think, I think that's how he settled in Ohio. And what's in Ohio? Goodyear. So we don't know if Goodyear attacked, you know, went to him or he went to Goodyear. But, um, you know, interesting thing is, for 50 years that Goodyear made the balloons, if you ever watched the parade of the 70s and the 80s, the telecast, all you heard of the early 80s was that these balloons are Goodyear, they're exclusive to Macy's Parade, etc. Now, the original setup that we found is that Saw owned balloons, he designed them, he was in association with Goodyear, and Macy's did a contract with him where Saw was responsible for costumes, props, floats. So evidently, he is the one that worked with Goodyear, and then he put those balloons on the parade. Um, it's interesting to note that <clears throat> Tony Saw, it's interesting that the in the beginning of the parade, he was his name was prominent in many of the ads. Now, mostly Macy's it gives the impression that it's a group effort. They usually don't try to keep uh, someone at the forefront. Usually, the parade director will have a lot of face time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But in the, usually, in the, as far as the parade studio or the balloons, you, you pretty much don't know who who's behind it. We do, of course. Yeah. Well. The TV. Well, you know, McFadden, Jean McFadden, she, she's the one that became the star. Yeah. And, and that's like as you explained it to me, like. Sarg's there from the beginning through 1944 to 41. 41. 41. When he, di he dies in 42. Right. Well, right after 41's parade. Well, you're all you're all college people. Yeah. Yeah. Let's sit, wait, wait, wait. Go Let's ahead. do a little quiz. Yeah. But what <laughs> happened? Wait, 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 wait. What happened? What happened a week or so after Thanksgiving 1941? But you know what happened a week after Thanksgiving 1941? Pearl Harbor. Yeah, Pearl Harbor. But the, the point I was trying to make is that the, the, it's, it's interesting to me that there are, there are three different periods of balloon, mm -hmm. balloon puppet performing. The, the Sarg period, which ends in when, at his death in, in, in Well, 41 was the last year, right. And then after the war in 45, it starts up again with Macy's now in charge working with Goodyear. Right. And that Macy's lasts right. until 80, the early, early 80s, 80s when uh, Goodyear gets out of the business. And McFadden comes in. And uh, starts this uh, the um, Aero, Aero. Oh, oh yeah, company. yeah. Well, see what happened and was and that's the company. That's the Raven that's Aero Star. Raven Aero Star, right. and they're organizing it to this day. Yes. So see, there's three different periods. Maybe yeah, three or four. What happened was Goodyear did it till eight, like let's say eighty one, eighty two. Okay. Goodyear was not making money. It was not profitable doing one balloon every seven years. Okay, so every five years. They had, I think the last balloon really, well the first balloon Gene got was Kermit the Frog, 77. Okay? Now, you see these, see like, we always want to talk about the engineering. When, when you look at the Goodyear balloons, now this is interesting, and again, Bart was talking about all this, you know, the Tony Sock. These balloons were done by an engineer. Okay, no computers, no fancy stuff, no CAD programs. These guys had to sit at a drafting board. They had to do this. Okay, they had to figure out talking with Bodhi about the technology, about the, how much lift you need to get these balloons in the air. There was no computer programs to help you do this. This is when you used the slide rule and you used okay. yeah, you did it with the brain. And these guys did a good job. So they were drawn by Goodyear engineers. Okay? They had a team of people like Goodyear. They mainly were women that did the, the cutting of the fabric and put them together. Okay. And these, these uh, this says uh, 1961 for the Bullwinkle and Underdog Bull, yeah. there. 65 is Bullwinkle. He's the most famous guy. But, so again, this is all engineering. So Sog would work with Goodyear. Goodyear engineered the balloons. And these things flew from, let's say, 28, because that's when helium comes in. Goodyear did it about 81, 82. Okay, for people around, like, like we were talking earlier, for people our time frame, I'm not telling you how old I am, but 
Bullwinkle underdog. That's my point of reference. Okay, I see Tracy down here. I bet she's going to we talk about SpongeBob. That's her favorite. Maybe that's her favorite movie. <laughs> so I can tell how old she is compared to all that. But so you'd have an iconic balloon for you know for each different generation. We were talking earlier today. The engineering. I don't know anything about it, but SpongeBob and Modi confirmed this to me, John and, and Chris. I said, you know, when you think about technology today, like like John pointed out, the new people today, Raven Arrow stuff. SpongeBob was hailed as a miracle when they made the first SpongeBob like 20, uh, 15 years ago, whatever it was. It, it's a square balloon. So Chris and John and I say, well, you know, square balloon. What's so hard about that? But we, from my understanding, there is some kind of internal frame inside. And Modi confirms, he said, it's, it's really hard, it was impossible to make a square balloon. But the technology today, they figured it out. Okay? They couldn't do that back then. Okay? But the interesting thing is, for me and Chris, and maybe John too, maybe Modi, we'll say, if you look at these balloons, there's a charm about them. They took a balloon and they made a character. In a way, I love the new balloons today, but to me, they're too perfect a copy of the, of, of the character. It's a carbon copy. To me, this is a balloon, right? But Sog, his genius was inventing a new form. Now, I, I just want to step in there. Like, I, I wonder if we could just think about the, the, the engineering of the balloons, because that's such a fascinating aspect of them, because when Sarg is shifting from doing like European style marionettes to the, the upside down marionettes, I mean, the, this, this change of scale is, is gigantic. And the puppeteers are always, it's all about the materials, you know. It's yes. very specifically about the materials. And the materials, as, as Dr. Anwar was saying, are like, uh, and you were saying earlier, I think it's rubber and, and or rubber impregnated cloth. But the shapes, so you know, I mean, these these aren't Sarg shapes, but Sarg balloons, uh, you see him make, working with cylinders and cones and spheres, and oftentimes sort of putting them together uh, to create these characters. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, and I wonder about you know what are the dynamics of that kind of a construction? Like, what do you need to keep in mind when you're working with? gas-filled balloons and patterning and, and shapes because the, 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 the Goodyear balloons, of course, for the, the war department which are, or for yeah. weather balloons are pretty, pretty uh, pure shapes right. that, that, that work for, for, for the job of raising things up to, to look at well, stuff. Well, well these are mini something blimps. Different. Well, by the way, these are mini blimps. Like, that's what it is. It's a mini blimp. Interesting thing is, again, we were talking about this earlier, and John was bringing this out, and we explained how it's done. Interesting thing is, during the early parades in the 30s, these balloons are designed, they're not one piece, okay? Mm -hmm. Chambers. They're chambers. Example, let's say, uh, let's take Bullwinkle, he's going down the street, and his arm hits a, a, a uh, branch, the arm deflates, but guess what? The thing can still fly down. It's not going to deflate, so that you know it will stay flying. During the 1930s, 40s, there were numerous accounts in the papers where they had like a emergency crew, like an ambulance, driving in the parade. That if a balloon got punctured, punctured, and those got punctured, in the middle of the parade, they would patch it and, and, and put more more healing into it. Now they couldn't do it. I, once we yeah, got yeah, with the uh, TV. mighty mouse balloon that, yeah, had it, that, the, uh, yeah. that died in the Columbus Circle. You see this, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the yep. but they couldn't do it starting in the 50s. And you know who they, and the demon was television. Because they had to be on television, they had a certain time slot. So they could not stop the parade. Okay. Off topic just a bit, if you look at Miracle on 34, I told John had to ask me a good question, Modi too. They asked me, was this parade always known as the Macy's Crit, you know, thanks in Paris? These guys brought this to me, you know. And the point that we make is this, number one, from 1924 until 1933, it was the Macy's Christmas Parade. It was never a Thanksgiving parade. In 1934, for some reason, we don't know why, it becomes the Macy's Santa Claus Parade for one year. In 1935, it becomes the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. 
Now, if you look at the old newsreels, no one in the world knew what the Macy's Parade was. No one knew what it was. If you look at the newsreels from the 40s and the 30s, you're going to see giant behemoths in the streets of New York City. Grotesque figures, you know, behemoths, giant balloons. No one knew what it was. 1946, they make Miracle on 34th Street. It was filmed at the parade that morning. Okay, we, they couldn't stop the filming. They did those scenes. Boom, 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 boom. Edmund wins on Santa Claus Blue. Now, the, the film comes out in 1947 in the spring. Off, it was off season. They don't know how to promote this movie. If you <laughs> check out the trailer from Miracle on 34th Street, it's a romance. It's love. It's a love story. It's a comedy. It's groovy. This 1947 is groovy. <laughs> and guess what? The movie comes out in 1947 around the world, and guess what the world finds out? The Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. So in a way, this is why Macy's loves the Miracle on 34th Street. Every year you get Macy's, Santa Claus, Macy's, Santa Claus, Macy's. They've been getting tons of, tons of PR, but this told the world was the Macy's Parade. Sog created a Christmas parade, okay? Interesting thing about Sog and the balloons. The first few balloons, the first year, they were very generic. You had an elephant, you had a bird, whatever it was, dragon, okay? Not until 1929, the Sog, this is the genius of Sog, the branding of Sog, and I think John likes this point too. This is the branding that Sog did. Sog reaches out to the creators or the owners of the Cats and Jammer Kids. From the, you know, they were famous comic strip, the Captain and the Kids, the Cats and Who Jammer Who the Cats and Jammer Kids? Uh, there you go. <laughs> very famous characters, okay? So 1929, you see in the Macy's Parade, the Macy's Christmas Parade, you have Mama Cats and Jammer, the first female, the first female character in the parade. Years later, Jean said it was uh, olive oil. She was wrong. but. So he goes to branding, and he goes to famous characters to sell. He is now creating characters of famous comic strips, cartoons. He goes to Disney. We were discussing this. And to this day, John said, did he work with? We do not know how Mickey Mouse came about as a balloon. But we did find footage from a college and archive. You know, I have them stored away. 1934, out in California, at the Goodyear facility in California, there is a film clip of Mickey Mouse being inflated in the hangar. And we have, we have the picture of that. You see the Mickey Mouse, but guess what? The footage, we didn't know this until we saw the footage. In, in the picture, you see a little inky dinky guy wearing a trench coat, oh, just stand there watching. If you see the film footage, guess what? It's, not, it's Walt Disney. He's holding a little Mickey Mouse and he's looking at his giant Mickey Mouse balloon. But to this day, we don't know. What year was that? 1934. Okay. So we don't know. Sorry. So we don't know. Did Disney pay Sog? Did Sog have to pay Disney? Because Disney was notorious for that. Okay? I mean, he knew how to license his characters and he made money from them. Mm -hmm. So now, the thing is, everything started with Goodyear. Mm -hmm. Then it went to Kemp's. Oh, Kemp. So, I mean, what, what was, how was the decision, what happened? Was it a business decision to go from... <clears throat> from Goodyear's yeah. point, yeah. You know, like I said, Chris and I went to the Witness Protection Program. We go to Goodyear. Well, let's just say that the, the, uh, Goodyear to this day still proudly uh, promotes their social parade. Well, well not really. Like, you know what it is? At, when Chris and I started working on the first book, they give us the, you know, they flipped us the bird, so to speak. <laughs> we don't want to talk about the lawyer from the lawyer from Goodyear. We don't want to talk about that ancient history, really. They were nothing. We don't talk about that. But guess what? About six, seven years later, if you talk to Goodyear people today, we're heartbroken that the association doesn't let it's not around today. That was our history. So now the new people come in saying, "What happened?" And John, had, you know, oh, Modi. So I want to interject that when we started our, our project, uh, a parade. History was kind of in the back burner for everyone. I think I think one of the things that I'm working with uh, Ripple here is that he has a lot of enthusiasm, and I started to see a lot of uh, doors opening in regards to the parade and parade history, in regards to Goodyear, in regards to Macy's. It's now commonplace now that people want to look back. And they still get it wrong today. <laughs> exactly. But, but you know, the, you yeah. know, you know, Chris. Interesting thing is, okay, 
Jean McFadden comes in, 77. That was her first year. Jean just passed away a, a year and a half ago. But she was there for many years. But Jean came in 77, and her first big get was Kermit the Frog. That was a huge get for her. Mm -hmm. Now, like we were talking with that, that this great Ballad Institute has one of my heroes. They have Scooter from The Muppet Show. They actually have the real Scooter. Oh. Well, if we have a photograph. <laughs> no, 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 no. But you, I actually saw the real puppet. You had the real puppet. We had it on display, and then Henson wanted it back. Oh, so. oh. <laughs> I don't know. I don't oh, know. Oh, here. But no, <laughs> but we, were, we were here. We have other Henson puppets yes. here. We were here mm -hmm. in like 1999. Yes. And Mr. Ballard, he went to a little room, and he came out, and he goes, look what i got to show you. And it was Scooter. Oh, my God, it's Scooter. Chris is saying, Bob, is, he's not a real actor. He's an actor, Scooter, the Muppet Show. Bob is a puppet. It's a it's Scooter. So, you know, I went crazy for the Scooter. But, so Kermit was a big get. Sesame Street character, big get, okay. So did, would Sesame, the, 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 the situation now is that the, the company that owns the image, as you pointed out earlier when we were talking, pays for... They pay about a million dollars. So did Sesame Street or somebody pay to have Kermit in the parade? Sure. Parade? You see, the way, you see, or we talk about commercialism million today. They paid a million dollars? Yeah. The rights holders pays about a million dollars. Excuse me, example. SpongeBob or Snoopy, United Home Syndicate, whatever it's called, you know, the, the comic strip, the, the, the distributor. They pay Macy's a million dollars. Okay? It's for a three year contract. Macy's, that pays for the cost of the balloon, like John. I did not think Bodhi said it. Years ago, it was $50,000. Those balloons, SpongeBob, was like $300,000 to make. So Macy's actually owns a physical balloon, but they have to fly that balloon for three years. This is why Macy's is so tough on flying these balloons. They have to fly these balloons because if you have a bad weather situation, bad storm, Guess what? The balloon doesn't fly. Yeah. They owe Henson another fly. And it's TV time, as you said. It's right. Time. Yep. So, but interesting thing is, so Gene gets Kermit, and what happens is, um, Goodyear says, we're getting out of this. They get out of it. They want to get out of it, and that's when Kemp, so Modi mentioned Kemp. Kemp came in. Kemp takes... This is Kemp Aerostar. No, no, this is Kemp Balloons. Kemp Balloons. Got he come, Yeah, he comes in for just a short period of time, and he makes... And when is that again? What this is around 83. Okay. Okay. He makes three balloons, which are killers. He makes olive oil. He makes um, Woody Woodpecker. Yeah. And he makes Yogi Bear. Those were all yeah. Kemp Balloons. Well, guess what? They were spectacular. They go behind... Gene goes to Kemp and says, Okay, we want you for us but you can't do any other work. You gotta be specific to, to, to Macy's. And Kemp said, you're crazy, I can't survive on this. I got a, I got a, a business. So they broke the relations. So as John mentioned, that's when they turned, they actually, actually helped get a company up and running. It's called Raven Aerostar. They're in South Dakota. And they're the ones that have been doing these spectacular booms for the last you know, 30 something years. Although, as we spoke earlier, Macy's in their studio in Minacci, in New Jersey, if I'm saying it right. Minucci, whatever. Okay. Yeah, Minaki, whatever. Yeah. They're making some of the small balloons, okay? In house, now in Jersey. Now, interesting thing John was pointing out. We showed him some images, and we have the 1945 clown balloon. You have the 1946 baseball player. Okay. You have a police officer, and you have a fireman. All in different years. Yes, consecutive years. Now this shows you what makes me mad. Everybody knows it. Chris loves it. Bob's a hot-headed Italian. I get mad so easy with these people. Don't get mad. Oh, no, I get mad. <laughs> I'm going to give you a homework assignment. No, he just looked up like, huh? So the last <laughs> I mean, since, since, how, since, how, since the fireman was recreated like in 1987, how was the fireman? How was the policeman? How was the clown? And I'm a gentleman, I don't curse, but I said, so I called Macy's up. Who the hell is Howard? Where'd you get his name from? It was the baseball player, the fireman, the clown. In fact, it was Bobo the clown. 
So that's what gets me what makes it. So it was, it was basically one, for one inflatable puppet, and then the next year they changed it, they it's added a hat, they right. put something in. The yes. next year they changed it. They repainted the it, they added it. Like example, Natalie Woods, you're on 4th Street. Watch the movie, yeah. everybody, this year. And I'm, I'm going to get your names of Chloe, but sure you watch it. <laughs> like when did Superman become? Superman became a football player. Football player. Yeah, football football year. Year. yeah. So yeah. They what they do is they repaint them. Yeah. They have a hat, the helmet. Recycle, reuse, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah they do. Yeah, so I said so. But Natalie, no longer now. No, no longer now. No. No. Yeah. No, but Natalie Wood says we're going to four street to John Payne. He was a he was a clown wish, and they just changed it. And they put yeah, they just changed his head. They put out whatever. So Macy's was being very innovative. They, they were being cheap. They're not making new yeah. balloons. This is what they were doing. Now, interesting thing is, John's gonna love this, but let's go back to puppets. Watch. We never left puppets. Go back to the puppets. Watch the parade this year. Well, you know what? I don't want to torture you guys. But watch the parade, and I say that because it's all good. It's, 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 it's 30 seconds of parade, 10 minutes of commercials. But if you watch the balloon come down the street, John's gonna love this. John, I want you to watch this. I this will. <laughs> and you see them, they pull the string, and the, and, and the balloon waves. That's the puppet. So every so often Macy's gets your memo. It's a puppet. You pull the string as it goes down, and you see the balloon wave. They, they're using it as a puppet. I wondered, like, I, earlier um, Chris was talking about his experience manipulating or, or being mm -hmm. one of He was the, a balloon handler. Yeah. Oh. Being a balloon handler. And I wonder if you could talk briefly about that experience, you know. As as a puppeteer, as it were, one of twenty, I think you said, and I, and I guess, it, or maybe more or less, um, you know, as, as for us puppeteers, it's always about how do you move the object or part of the object, and what things are you trying to control or think about or adjust to, and what does the object want to do, well, and how do you so deal with what the object wants to do? The wind tells you what to do. The object, um, well, first of all, the, the, you have a, a, one person who's in charge. The rest of the persons are just employees who get a tutorial in the morning very quickly. Now, the thing with the helium balloon is the object wants to rise up, and it is very, very powerful. And that's, you see on television, it looks really, yeah, it's cute, you're holding the, uh, of it. but it's, it's a, the healing is rising constantly. So you're giving it a little slack, but you're trying to keep it down. Now what happens is if you wanted to, if you wanted to just rise up with it, you could. Your feet would come up with it. Oh. So it's, and they said if it wraps around, let, let, oh, let, let the skin go, go down, because yeah. it will take your whole arm off. Cut your arm. Well, you and know, it's right, because it's really, and so, if you're doing this for hours, you have the impression that you're the only one guiding this thing, right? So you're, you're following your other 20 or so people, but it's so powerful that you're just trying to get around the corners without it the hitting wind something. Dictates the wind is a different character. The wind, well, you yeah. see, you know, this is funny. Gene told me him a story. I had known him. We, we were in Gene's office in the late 90s, okay? This shows you how, you know, Everybody here, I bet you, did something stupid without thinking and just say, ooh, ooh what did I just do? 1989 was the famous year that we had the snowstorm the night before. Okay, you had six inches of snow. That was the year that you had the Backstreet Boys in the parade. No, no, wait, not the Backstreet Boys. Who was in the parade? Yeah. 89. What were the boys? Uh, Menudo, somebody. I mean, it was really. <laughs> Maybe it was the but somebody. Famous. Yeah, 1989. No, 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 no. The, the kids from Boston. The singers from Boston. New kids on the block. New kids on the block. It's not all big and beat up. <laughs> but they were in the parade that year. Okay. So, the night before, we had the snowstorm. Me and Chris were there, and we were there with Manny. We, we met Manny there, so it was funny. He like, I don't worship. It's Manny Bears. All of his, his staff is telling him, you're a star, Manny. God recognizes you. But we leave and we go home. So anyhow, Gene told us a story many years later. Bugs Bunny was under the... Um, that was his year, Bugs Bunny, and he's under the net. And a gust of wind comes and picks him up. Jean goes and runs and she grabs a rope, and she said she wound up 30 feet in the air on this balloon. Oh. She didn't realize, and she grabbed it, and the lift took her right up. One person, I mean, this thing's under One the net. Yeah. And she said they had a common they had it work, and they all jumped to grab her. People yeah. said, that's how, you know. Now, a few years later, boy, was I a dope. Chris is going to tell you, I was a dope. He, he said, Bob, you're a dope in this. We can find him in the print in 2001. He said to me, 
is this a good thing to be here? September 11th. So we're oh, that's pray. right. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. We were at the parade that day, and they got to help the bomb, the helicopters. We will. Should we really be here? I said, well, you know. But interesting thing was, okay, with the, the whole incident with, the, with, with those balloons. So I, I was a clown for 11 years. He gave up after a second. Yeah, I'm not doing this the way you're crazy. So I get an email. Hey, Bob, how would you like to be? How would you like to go to the test flight in the summer? You know that we get people. How would you like to be a balloon handler? We're trying to get people to switch around a little bit. I said, no, sure, I'll go. So I go to my mother. Hey, you want to take a ride? My father, you want to take a ride? Sure. So we get in my car and we drive to Stevens Institute in Jersey. It was, just, it was like 90 degrees. The first day of June or something. Like they had a heat wave. My father at the time was like 70 years old, 65 years old. My father grabs the straw. He took 20 steps. One, two. He goes, you're crazy. He dropped the rope and he said to Robin Hall in charge of prayer, you guys are crazy. I'm gonna, so he sat on the curb and he had himself donuts and coffee. That's what he did. My mother, she went and grabbed the string and she did it for three hours. And in, in, when you're operating, you, um, Chris was talking about the, the, the lift that wants to pull you up. And I'm wondering, you know, when you're a puppeteer, you're, when you're doing more than one puppeteer on a puppet, you, sort of, you have this sort of communication with each other to make the next move. And I no, 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 you can't talk. No. The captain no, tells you. It's not necessarily the captain. Well, he tells you what to do. He, he shouted. You know what he does? He walks, he walks backwards uh -huh. on the streets. Of the, that, I mean, he's walking backwards on the streets of New York. He's telling them. And what, what, are the, what are the commands he's giving? Is, is it to well, let it go up or down? or left Well, bring it down, bring it up. They, they have a, a set way. But the thing what happened was, this is after a certain time in the history of the parade, it became a, it's a television show. Mm -hmm. So it has to be, even though it's starting at early in the morning uptown, it has to be at camera at a certain point. Right. So there's a point where you're, you're marching very quickly, very quickly, and then you're stopping. So what he's doing basically is being, being related to how navigation how they can get into Herald Square at a specific time for the for the balloon to be on camera for its big debut, right? Mm -hmm. But you also have celebrities who are singing. You have you know stop commercials, of course. Bob's uh, that Peter. And uh, <laughs> oh, but, you know, we should uh, I want to do, I think we should bring this up. I think that's mm -hmm. one of the first the history. One of the interesting things about the early history, and this is again during the Sarg era was, again, this is the 1920s, early 30s, it's an innocent time, and no one knew this, but they did, someone decided that it's a wonderful idea to let the balloons go. You, you see how we work? Do you see how we work? <laughs> Either we're both psycho or we're both psychic. I was gonna just bring that up to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. You know what, I mean, yeah, let's make it Why did they do that? They, it was going to have PR. A, a PR, it was going to a balloon race. Was it, the, was it depression? They decided they were, we're going to let the balloons go, and whoever catches it will get, get a cash prize. Yeah, they get a you know why? Yes. They, they, they were fixed with slow leaks. Well, it's all, it's all yes. Wait, yes. what it was? They were fixed with slow leaks. Yes. So that these things would, some of them, no exaggeration, I'll send it to John, some of them came to Connecticut. Oh. People would find them. And you would bring them back to Macy's, and they, and they would give them, it was like $10 or $5, whatever it was, they were rewards, they were like an envelope attached. You know what's something bizarre? Now, now tell them why it stopped. Oh, yeah, but so you, <laughs> you know what's something bizarre? This is hysterical, right? They tell you what, you know, like he said, you get in front of TVs, you know, don't wave to your mother and your father when you're on TV. Could you imagine that balloon getting into Herald Square? And then you see the TV cameras, and you have 40 balloon handlers say, oh, I'm on TV, and they drop the rope and they wave on the camera. <laughs> and they say, oops, they look, you know, that's what they did. They let the balloons so, so, go. So why did this stop? Two accidents. Two. You had you had a famous guy. Now maybe this is strange here. Clarence Chamberlain, I think his name was. He was top of my head. He was a, a very famous flyer. And he they let the balloon go. He's flying his plane and he sees it and he brings it down. And he caught the balloon. And it was all over the press. He got the balloon. How did he catch the balloon? On the wing of the plane. Wing of the plane. Okay. He actually snagged it with the wing of the plane. Wait, do you know, know which balloon it was? There's different. Somebody said it was like Felix, or it was the blue, the blue, whatever it was, a blue dragon. But interesting thing was, Herbert uh, John Strauss had said his father, who's one of the Macy's um, executives, had a picture of Chamberlain. But Chamberlain said in the press, "I want to get back to Macy's. I want the reward." And John said his father had a picture of a Chamberlain getting the check. Couldn't find it, but he had a picture. About a year later, well, 33, because it was the year of King Kong, 33, there was a woman flyer. Now listen, 
I love a woman get up there and fly an airplane. So don't tell me a woman can't fly an airplane. She was brave, this one here. She was brave. Mm -hmm. She was. Now we get beat up by the woman here. But she was brave. She was a student lawyer. Annette Gibson, the name sticks in my mind. And her, the poor guy was a schmo, he's the instructor. And he's sitting next to her. And she sees the balloon and she grabs it. Again, it gets stuck on the wing. And guess what happens? This was right over from Queens, New York, or Jamaica, New York. The plane goes into a control. A spin right down. And this guy is sitting next to this student. I mean, if I were him, I'd bail out. With <laughs> but guess what? He, he was able to get it just before it hit. She wound up like with her foot stuck in the, the belt, the seat, whatever you call it. She was hanging out. But yeah, she was nearly, she nearly killed him and you know, you know, her and him. And Macy said, that's it, we're not doing it anymore. So uh, this Thanksgiving is a traditional US event. You say, it's American culture. Mm -hmm. And all the balloons that you have been discussing so far, is it also US culture? Oh, here yes. <laughs> now, is there any change that we see in the future? There's been a couple of years. Now, again, I don't know. John is a, John and Modi are the experts on this. And I'm going to, I mean, they're experts. But look, look, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I saw this balloon and it scared the wits out of me. This didn't give me nightmares. They got this balloon this year. It looks like a sunburst. I don't know what it is. It's evidence in Japanese balloon or something. Oh, yeah. Yayoi Kusama. It's a love flies up to the sky is the name of her balloon for this year. Yeah, I never saw it. This thing is, I mean, what's this, you know? So they've done this in the past. Yeah, uh, they had a, a balloon by the artist Jeff Koons, which was yeah. just because it That's was the a, one. inflatable rabbit. Yes, it was he like a metal. Yeah. A metal version of an inflatable rabbit, I meant to, yeah. which he turned into a piece of art. And then they made a giant version of his metal version of an inflatable. So it's, it's and that interestingly, the designs are very similar to Sarg's in a way because it's more, more geometric more shapes. Yeah. 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 Good. That was great. Yeah, that we thing. The can, that the, um, can, can you show them the picture? No, you can't show. We can. Uh, we, we, I can turn around <laughs> my computer. So right now, it is eight to one. Yeah, we wanted to go to um, questions from the audience. Wow. Oh, thank you. Show them yeah, 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 some of your pictures to them. I think it way. might not be so great to do this PowerPoint here. <laughs> oh, come on. I'm sure they can see it. But, um, but we did want to go, it's 8 o'clock, and we did want to go to questions sure. from the audience. Yeah. I think that's since it's so fun. exciting. So if you can. Uh, yeah, I want to sit down. Oh, that's a, well, that's that's our shtick there, Bob. Bob, um, okay. I just I just want to mention that the um, you mentioned was it Gene McFadden was mentioned a couple times in this. Uh, but anyone know Gene McFadden? Okay, I, I want to go into. She was the she did okay. So she she was if you look in Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street, you see Maureen O'Hara working back and forth, and she really was a real life version of that. She was a very big in life uh, Texan. She. She was always on television uh, promoting the parade. But Bob and I, Bob got, really got to be good friends with her, but we got to sit down with her and Manny Four Bass. Four hours, yeah. Uh, it was a very good interview. And she, if you look at the old uh, the st uh, stills of the parade, for example, you see the, the balloons and you'll see down below, you'll see some dead space. Uh -huh. That's the way it was for years, of course. You know, people in New York loved it. And television was made some innovations. But she came up with the idea, she called it what? Human confetti. Yeah, 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 Confetti. Yeah, yeah. She always wanted something going on. She wanted every, every image filled. So you see, filled. you see, not only you see the balloons, but you come to teach came to the concept of balloons, which are sort of a mid-sized version. It's a smaller balloon on a float, for example. So you're not only just waiting for you see, you know, a band and then wait for the big balloon. You have something in between. Uh, she also instructed people to, to throw, you know, confetti, throw things lively. Uh, she really made it really into a pr production that was eye-filling. Uh, so the parade you see today on television is, has a lot of her footprint on it. I just want to give her a shout out. Yeah, no, she has she has a theatrical background. She's yeah. a very classy lady, though. Yeah. You know? Chris and I sat with her Lisa, for four hours. I mean, just one one time. I mean, you know, we were with her many times, but one time, four hours. Chris, like you said, you see her on television every year. She had the, the big black hat, the red. Mm -hmm. yeah. She had the te she called everybody, hey love, hey doll, Texas, you know, and. Um, we were talking for two hours. Yeah. And we had no. She walks over to the drawer. She takes a cigarette. She starts smoking. 
we, and like his face dropped, my face dropped, and she goes, I will never smoke on camera. She goes, we have a lot of kids watching, and I don't want the kids to see me smoke. The interesting thing is she, that's what she does. She, does, she wound up, about the phone, she had the throat box taken after the cancer. So, you know, she was really in tune to kids. And while we're talking interview, guess what she does? She goes and gets a yo-yo in front of us. So she starts doing walk the dog and all these flips with the yo-yo. She was like a little kid. And, and that's, why the, that's why she changed that parade. Yep. Yeah. Are there other questions from the audience? Yes, sir. I was under the impression that Felix the Cat was the uh -oh. first licensed character. Wait, 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 wait. Did you plant this guy here? <laughs> this, 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 is he a plant? Yeah. Hmm? What's your name? Paul. For what? Spirits of. I think I know you. No. <laughs> let's get the let's get the story straight real quick. Felix the cat. Felix the cat. Now, Chris pointed it out when we first started working. Gene McFadden point blank said to us, "We have no all. Hey, honey, we got no archives. You got more than we do." That's what she told us. But she wouldn't let us in the archives. Now, somebody gave somebody somebody grew up a friend of Goodyear. And he gets a balloon list, typed balloon list from Goodyear, and some clown hand wrote on this balloon list in ink. It was all typed out, but he writes Felix the Cat. So Chris and I talk with Macy's, oh, Felix the Cat was a friend. So for about 35 years, Macy's was going with a balloon list that someone wrote something on. Okay, we couldn't prove it. So Chris and I do the book. And we basically ate the legend. Felix the Cat was the first balloon. Chris and I had a picture in the first book. You'll see it. Now, don't scream and throw water at us. That's what we thought when we did the book. That was the legend. They wouldn't let us go in, and arch in the archives. In about 2006, I learned about a new thing called the internet. I didn't get on to it. What's this? So I started typing in the internet. Started, right? And I find. That picture of Felix, and if you look in back of, see, this is why they call me the king of research. You look in the back, I see the stores, and guess what? The stores are Newark, New Jersey. There was a Bamberg parade for about 30, 40 years. In the late 1920s, Bamberg was bought by Macy's. So Sog basically did both parades. I think the, good, I think the, the Bamberg parade was a day after Thanksgiving. So anyhow, long story short, so we, that's what we did. We the first had photographs book. from the Bamberg parade. Right, and we, we thought, thought it was Macy's. Macy's for a while. That's what we, we were taught. It was Bamberg. Okay, so anyhow, I got this nut coming at me. I think it's going to kill me. Plus, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. And then, 90th anniversary comes around. And they're going to redo Felix for the 90th anniversary. So I'm starting to get threatened. Macy's going to sue you. Macy's going to sue you. Why? I'm telling the truth. So anyhow, long story short, everybody go out there and research this stuff. Don't listen to anybody. Research. You're at a great college, you use a library, you use the facilities. Research. I said this. The first characters that we see in the newspaper mentioned was, was the Cats and Jammer Kids in 1929. Chris and I made the decision. We're going to research year by year, but we're going to use the New York Times, the paper of record. The New York Herald Tribune, what a great paper that was. It was great. Yep. It went out business in the 60s. And the New York Daily News. Okay. So, Every year, we went year by year, and we, if we can prove that each of the three papers mentioned this in the parade, we said we're confident. Okay. The first time Felix the Cat is actually mentioned is in 1931. So, I bet Bart knows this back there. Mickey Mouse overtakes Felix in 1928 as the most famous cartoon character. He was a sensation for the first, the first talking cartoon, Steamboat Willie. So, Felix the Cat was the most famous character. How come not one paper mentions that Felix the Cat is in the Macy's Parade? It didn't happen to 31. So, I changed my opinion. Uh, I have film footage. Go on my Facebook page and you'll see it from 1927 from the University of South Carolina. They are the holders of the movie tone outtakes. They sent me 1927's footage. No Felix the Cat. So, uh, in working with the University of Akron, yeah, we worked with the work with the University of Akron. This one person contacts them. He's trying to go behind my back and say you're wrong. Guess what? Now the University of Akron said, guess what? We went through all the newspapers, and Robert's right. The first time he's mentioned is in 1931. Why would a world famous character not be mentioned in 1927? Yet the Cats and Jam is mentioned 29. Until we can find proof saying 
yes or no, we were being neutral, but it looks like he's right. Why is no one mentioning the world's most famous cartoon character going to be the first woman that makes the parade? Think about this, 27 was the first year. I would think you're going to see Felix the Cat is the first balloon of Macy's. Tony saw it, Felix the Cat, historical, yeah, never happened. So that's that good to clear that, uh, is that clear that up? No, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 so that's so, what I, so, so it was nine. So Felix the Cat was what year? 1931. It was actually 29. Oh. And then you have Mickey Mouse on 34. Any questions? 34. Yeah. 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 Well, how about you and then the like, person in the back? Go ahead. Okay. Me first? Sure, Thank go you. ahead. I'm sorry, I was a little late, but I'm really interested in the engineering of the very early balloons. Very good. Go ahead. Um, namely, I'm interested in, uh, I know Sarg was an artist and uh, very talented, and how the production went in Ohio, but then how the art was, or how the paint was um, layered onto the balloons itself, because I would imagine as an artist, he may not want to release that to people who are working with rubber to do the painting, which is a coat. Does anyone know anything about how that early process went with the painting or the transfer of his um, character design onto the rubber? Oh, right. And well, you know what? If, if you go on YouTube, you will see from 1934, you will see, at, I think it's the British Pathing Newsreel, but you will see Mickey Mouse laying on his back, part of him painted, part of him not painted, and you will see Goodyear workers painting him. I think they use um, spray, you, I've seen photos of like these old fashioned spray yeah. paint. Yeah, it was so spray painting. Spray painting. Yeah. I don't it, know what kind of paint. Yeah, but. and there's also really good footage of um, Ferdinand the Bull, and it's color footage from 1938, and you see him being painted at the balloon room, and Goodyear must have had a room dedicated to, like, I guess where they can paint this stuff. No, uh, Goodyear, at that particular time, there was a hangar in Akron, it's the, Ohio. Ohio. Yeah, yeah. That's the, yeah. the, the air dock. Uh, so One this of is them. where most of the work actually took place. Mm -hmm. Chris, the, yeah. yeah. yeah we, went to the, we went to the University of Akron, we went to that air dock, which was massive. As a matter of fact, it's so huge, it has its own weather pattern. Yeah, yeah, it's like three yeah. football yeah. fields. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, they told you that you could be in an attraction rain in the air dock or snow yeah. in the wintertime because uh, of the air. The, 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 the my, my, my short question, uh, 7th century between Central Park West and Columbus is uh, bordered on one side by the Museum of Natural History. I kind of grew up in that neighborhood and spent many a night before the parade mm -hmm. marching up and mm -hmm. down that street. And I was wondering if, there, if you've researched the archives of the Museum of Natural History, since it's been right there that it's been starting from for so long, I wonder if they have anything, anything they, on it. They might, you know, they, um, when Dino was retired, the original Dino, the dinosaur, the, 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 the St. Clair dinosaur, they retired him there. They had a big, they air inflated him in, in the museum and it was, they got a lot of coverage. But yeah, um, we were never there. We were to the New York Historical Society, which is on the same street. Yeah, right, we were there. We, we had, we had a, a lot of trouble doing the research because, you know, if any of you guys are interested in Macy's and you contact them and you say, hey, can we come and do research? Guess what the answer you're gonna get? No. If you contact who? Macy's. They'll say no, and their line is, we are not a research facility, we are an ongoing business. Chris and I got in, well, I got it, Chris didn't get in, because I was working on the second book. But Macy's had nothing. That's, well, I was going to interject that we, it was a hard research process. A lot of people, there were, you know, everyone has barriers. Remember the New York Daily News? We had to sell, oh, we, had to, we had to finagle, we give Let me tell you, so. let me tell you. <laughs> there was a higher power a lot of times. Yeah. We, went to, we went to the New York Daily News. Mm -hmm. and, and, go ahead. And a gentleman, his name was Bill Martin. Funny thing, Billy Martin, he was not the baseball player. But he took us into the, he took us into the archives. He lets me, guess what happened? He takes this, he had a box of photos that no one knew existed. He takes them and he locks them in a storage, a storage closet, closet, he locked them away. So Chris and I worked on the book. Guess what happens? Macy stole our book, but our book came out. But uh, what happened was, when Macy sees our book, they go to the Daily News and say, wait a minute, you lied to us. Look at these pictures these guys got. You're telling us there's nothing. Well, guess what had happened? We had the Xeroxes. The guy, Billy Martin, retires. And no one knew this box was locked away in this closet. 
I think that's really interesting in terms of like puppet history because a lot of puppet history is not recorded. It's no, not archived. No, 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 this is one of the most important aspects of puppetry in the United States in the 20th century, and it's so fascinating that it's not archived. But this gentleman back here had a question. Uh, Hamilton. Uh, I just wanted to return to a comment, Betty, that you made at the very beginning about helium being a finite resource. And, and, There's and, a shortage in that, they say. And, and when, when you buy this, this helium balloon at Stop and Shop that says happy uh -huh. birthday on it, yep. and the helium escapes, it goes up and up and up, and it's gone forever, off into the interstellar medium. The University of Connecticut uses a lot of helium, mostly in the form of liquid helium, for cryogenics here in stores, and also at the health center for magnetic resonance imaging work. And the university has now required that everybody who uses liquid helium, there's a recovery and recycling effort. Interesting. Two parts to that, it, it's, it's a financial part, it's a supply and demand argument, and a social responsibility argument. Whenever you have a finite resource, if you use it all up, future generations won't have any. So my question to you is, do you recycle your helium from these balloons? You know what? No, Macy doesn't recycle. No. Shame on you. Well, not on me. Not on me. Shame, shame, shame on me. No. Is it possible to recycle helium I, gas? I never sure. heard of that. Sure. They, they use liquid, liquid helium, which then uh, 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 becomes a gas, and then it's captured, and and, and then a compressor puts it back into a high pressure. You, you think it would be possible just to bring the gas back into some? Sure. Pump it out of the balloon. Pump it out of the balloon. It it just, it's actually the, the, the it, deflation it, it, process. It's seven seconds long now. Yeah, but the, the, the deflation process it. is so quick. Once it goes yeah. past, yeah. once it goes past 34th Street and it, it comes down Macy's, the corner, yeah. you, you don't even see it. It comes down 34th and it goes around 7th. Yeah. Guess what? They got the tops it's, down, they put down, they go like this. They rip the panel. It's, panel. it's a rip panel. I mean, uh, because of PDM oh. yeah. shortage. And it's flattened. A couple of years. Helium was actually not used in some of the balloons. Well, yeah, Modi, uh, 58. 58 was such uh, a bad shortage. But now, uh, but now, for lifting, it's only 70% of helium that we use right now in this country. But I think most of the time, it's actually the cost benefit analysis that if I have to deflate and I have to cool it down to 4.2 degrees Kelvin, is that more expensive? So it is end of the day is going to be Macy's cost benefit analysis that's going to trump if we are supposed to deflate and reuse it versus let it go. But you know what though, Modi, he makes but, a good point. But I got news for you: the Dollar Tree uses more helium than Macy's. With the Happy uh, Birthday balloons. Uh, the thing is, uh, yes, but there are like magnetic levitation. That's a huge use of uh, of liquid helium because we have to levitate. And definitely in the medical industry, there's a lot, all of those uh, <coughs> sort of very cryogenic applications and so on. But all the time, they actually keep on saying that we have 744 billion cubic feet of uh, helium reserve right now, with additional trillion plus somewhere else in the world. Uh, and so we are safe for the time being. Uh, so how long is that time being is going to be, we don't know. Let me show you a question. Yeah, question. Yeah, I'd like to know, I, I thought that um, one of the very first balloons that Tony Sard created for the parade were sort of like wearable heads no, that no, were being played. Is that? That was in the 30s. They, they did that. And Macy's is recreating that. Yeah, they have big spherical, this a round head. Yeah. Macy's is trying to recreate that. They've done like the Marx Brothers. They you can on. see the, the, there's photographs, it's like a, a, a performer, and then on their head, it's like they have an inflatable mm -hmm. on top of their head. I don't know if they're in the thing or it's on top it of it. It might just be like the first year. Yes, we don't know. I don't know if it's the first year. It's, I don't know what year it is, but it's pretty, looks it, pretty from what we, If you look at the photos on the, on the corner, the back, you might say, back of the corner, it might say 0031, so you would say 1931. You know? So the time is 8.18, and uh, maybe some time for them to sign some of the books that you already have. So we'll entertain one last question. Yes, sir. Robert, are you aware of any videos coming out on Tony Sark's life? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Very good, thank you. And then, you know what, check it. When you, I'm right. assuming it's going to be on the, on the American uh, Experience website. It's not going to be on the show. It's on the website. It's a creative website. 
Um, it's going to be about the Nantucket sea monster. The big hoax. That's going to be air, yeah. It's going to be airing. Well, they're going to put it on the Next website. It's Wednesday. Yeah. <coughs> it includes interviews with Bart Rocker Burton. So. Also, everybody, check out the check out our Facebook. I check out the Facebook page. Okay, you see this stuff. We're going to have it there. It's called. The Big Parade History Project. Big Parade History Project Facebook page. Right. And source. we're also going to be, uh, University of Akron is digitizing a clip from 1957 for me of the balloons being inflated in a warehouse. Great. So I don't know which ones they are. From, I mean, if I knew 57, then, you know, probably Papa. So um, we, we need to, we, the, we would like to leave here by 8.30 because the bookstore has to close and it's, and it's, it's right. possible to have conversation with Chris sure. and Bob who will be autographing books. We want to thank Chris and Bob and Betty uh, for a great <laughs>